Dialogue at the Wilson Center is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And now here's your host, John Molusky. Hello and welcome to the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. This week, during our final broadcast of 2012, we'll take a look back at the year in review with a very special guest. After nine terms, Jane Harmon resigned from Congress in February of 2011 to lead the Woodrow Wilson Center as its director, president, and CEO. She's the first woman to hold that post. During her time in Congress, she established herself as a national expert at the nexus of security and policy issues and served on all of the major security committees in the House of Representatives. Congressman uh, Harmon, welcome to the program. Thanks Thank for you, John. Us. I think it's my first time on this show. It is, and it's really great to have you. What an honor uh, for me. Why did we wait so long? That's the question I, I have. Let's let's take a look back at the year. If we were doing a year in review a year ago, we might start with the same place, the Middle East, the Arab Spring, or if you prefer, the Arab Awakening. It continues to be perhaps the most volatile region on the planet. And, and my thought is, generally speaking, how are you feeling about developments? At first, there was lots of enthusiasm, lots of optimism that this was going to be this grand democratic awakening. Well, first, the Wilson Center brings enormous expertise to this problem. We have a Middle East program headed by Halea Esfandiari, who is uh, known worldwide because she was imprisoned by the Iranians when she was visiting her mother um, some years back and wrote a book about it. Uh, but at any rate, uh, we understand these countries and their connections to each other. Uh, the Arab awakening was a surprise. Uh, I'm one who follows intelligence carefully, as, as you mentioned. And there were not enough hints about this, although, in fairness, we, did, we didn't really understand how to read social media. We now do. Uh, but nonetheless, there were not enough hints about this. Once it happened, uh, the Wilson Center has been all over this thing. And uh, I, I think as of this point, with, with events in, in enormous flux, uh, I would predict that, uh, one, it's irreversible. We're not going back to strong men. Uh, two, that um, Islamist parties will play a big role, even though things are uneven in, in, a, in a variety of countries. Uh, Islamist parties are here to stay. These are Muslim societies. And to the extent that they remain democracies, many of them will vote for Islamist parties. Number three, that's not so bad. Because if they're inside the tent having to govern these countries, they will have to moderate uh, some of their views. It's much better to have these parties inside the tent, I argued in a book that we published at the Wilson Center called The Islamists Are Coming, than to have them outside like Al Qaeda trying to blow up the tent. So I don't know where all of this will be going. I hope that the secular parties in these countries uh, develop better political skills so that they can win elections. At the moment, not so good. Uh, but I, I hope over time that what it looks like a messy transition will result in uh, democracies with a little d that don't look like our democracy, not that we have a lot to brag about at the moment either, uh, but they don't look like our democracy, but look like a pluralist society in which the people there uh, participate in ways that they feel respects their dignity and offers opportunity. You've traveled to the region several times. What have you learned firsthand that it was hard to tell looking at the situation from a distance? Well, what I have really learned, especially in Egypt, where I visited three times in the last year, is how poor the political skills are of most of the people in the country. Uh, it's not a question of uh, this team has good skills and that team has bad skills. It's that uh, there is modest ability to understand that you work within the system, that working within the system means that you have to compromise and that you have to accommodate each other's views and that the result probably won't please either side. Now, that's something our They're Congress doesn't seem to know. Yeah. yeah, well, they are starting from scratch. And our democracy was slow and evolving. We, we uh, won the Revolutionary War against um, Britain. A lot of Americans don't even know whom we fought. Uh, in 1776, we stood up our republic in 1789, and it took us uh, a long time to include everyone in our democracy and even to give women the right to vote, which didn't happen until 1920. Another, uh, at the risk of sounding glib about it, a ticking time bomb in this region is Iran's nuclear program. Uh, what's the timeline that we're on? Well, I, I, it's, the question is, what's the timeline that they're on? Uh, the intelligence that we and the Israelis have shows that they are close 
to developing breakout capability. Close means next year, 2013. What will they do with that is, is unknown. And many people are predicting, including uh, the experts we have at the Wilson Center, that they'll go up to the edge, but they won't go over the edge. Uh, and that will be deliberate. Um, but breakout capability is capability. Oh, and we have to understand that, and we have to measure what that means across the region and what that means to us. And 2013 is the year where this comes to a head? Yes. Uh, my guess is next summer is when it comes to, to a head. The, the sanctions, the worldwide sanctions against Iran that we have participated in developing are um, back-breaking sanctions. And the middle class in Iran is disappearing, and the manufacturing center is disappearing, and there are shortages everywhere, and their currency has been massively devalued. So it's a real hardship for the people who live there. Another big story of the past year is the continuing story about the rise of China and a leadership change in China. So we'll do the pivot that President Obama has promised. Uh, w tell us about your thoughts and your expectations for new leadership in China and how this might have an impact on ongoing relations with the U.S. And well, the there's, the there's new leadership in many countries. China's just one of them, uh, and we monitor that, again, at the, at the Wilson Center. Um, it's early to know what the change in leadership in China will mean. Uh, our policy in the region, our pivot, um, which wasn't the word that, that the president meant to use, our rebalance to Asia means that we're a bigger player across the region. And uh, our own Kissinger Institute and, and uh, Ambassador uh, Stapleton Roy, who heads our Kissinger Institute, which studies U.S.-China relations, uh, suggests that we need to help regional organizations in Asia, all of whom trade with China as we do and don't want China as an en enemy, but all of whom want to curb any appetites China may have toward a, a kind of uh, improper expansion in the region. And if we look at it that way, if we look at trying to keep stability in the region and promote trade, I think we have the best opportunity of having a positive relationship with China, which is certainly in our interest, and in having a positive relationship with all the countries in the region, especially the ASEAN countries, and that's in our interest. I want to segue to the, uh, the economy. And we can look at it as perhaps a global economic malaise, although there are outliers, Brazil, China, others that have done quite well. Uh, you've, you've made your, your thoughts known about the current situation in Congress and the gridlock and the inability to move forward. Looking back at the past year, uh, do you see signs of hope as it relates to the economy, or, or are you concerned? Well, I'm certainly concerned. Uh, Congress has a broken business model. I've said many times that there are talented people in both parties who currently serve in Congress and who are frustrated out of their minds because they can't make anything happen. Uh, I surely hope that by the end of the year, and um, as we air this broadcast, there are you know, only a few shopping days left, that Congress uh, will have at least avoided the cliff, the cliff meaning this series of catastrophes, the, <laughs> the expiration of the, of the Bush tax cuts and the sequestration requirements and, and uh, you know, the end of the payroll tax holiday and a variety of other things, which will raise the effective taxes on our middle class. Uh, hopefully we've avoided that, but I, my prediction is that if we have, it's going to be basically a shell game to get us a couple months more. Uh, if some miracle happens and we actually go big, put a deal together that is serious, uh, I would be thrilled. I, I doubt it. Uh, I, I, I worry a lot that we're eroding our power in the world by our inability to solve what should not be an impossible budget crisis at home. We are not Greece. We are not Portugal. Uh, we are not Italy. We don't have their serious structural problems. We have a smaller problem, and yet we can't solve it. The point you just made is a point I've heard you make several times, and it's an important point that is often left out of the discussion, is this isn't just a domestic issue that has to do with America's economy. It also has to do with America's standing in the world. Has our leadership taken a significant hit? I'd say yes, uh, a, a, uh, a voluntarily inflicted hit. Um, there are some problems that we can't solve. Uh, in the world. The world is a different world. It's not the bipolar world of the Cold War. It's a multipolar world. And a lot of what is the opportunity and the threat in the world doesn't respect national boundaries. We have to understand that. Um, cyber terrorism uh, is a worldwide threat, and it doesn't stop at the water's edge, and it doesn't stop at certain countries' edges, although you could target certain infrastructure. But 
the cyber threat is a global threat. Uh, the world economy is a global opportunity. And again, it doesn't stop. The, the, the nation state has declined, period, any nation state. So we're among those. Uh, but to the extent that our economy is a mess and not strong, uh, we are eroding our power in the world. And uh, I think if we don't solve it, we reduce the chances that America, which has stood for um, democratic, pluralistic, uh, inclusive uh, government, uh, won't be able to help shape some of those governments when our help is desperately needed. The stories we've talked about so far are, are things that we humans have done, but uh, big news often is things that we just react to, like Hurricane Sandy. Some of the talk has been that Hurricane Sandy will jumpstart the discussion of climate change and that we may see some not just domestic action but global action in that regard. What are your expectations? Well, severe weather is now a worldwide hazard and we've been, well, we've, we've had our share of, of uh, hurricanes and, and uh, tornadoes and earthquakes. I come from California where the fall, four seasons of uh, are, are earthquakes, floods, fires and riots, uh, but nonetheless, <laughs> Uh, we've had our share, um, but the devastation that some parts of the world have seen is worse than the devastation we've seen. Um, uh, my expectation is that we've got to build in resilience, that we've got to fix our, our, our outdated infrastructure, and this is an opportunity in two ways. One, it, it will create jobs. We have 23 million unemployed people, but it also gives us a chance to build in defenses against uh, cyber threats. Um, these old grids that we have uh, across our country uh, are sadly extremely vulnerable, not just to weather, but to um, computer attacks. And so uh, it would be a good thing if we could marry uh, two needs. One is jobs and two is, is uh, some kind of a, a, a protection against cyber threats and, and have a, uh, a, a huge investment, make a huge investment in inf infrastructure building in the next couple of years. I want to ask you about a, an issue uh, near and dear to your heart, and that's uh, women in political leadership roles are around the country and around the globe. Uh, how was 2012 as far as it goes in progress for women? Well, there's good news. The Senate now will have 20% women starting in 2013. That's unprecedented. The House is about clocking in about 17 to 18%. That's below the percentages in many other parts of the world. Uh, we have not had, uh, obviously, a woman president or vice president, as many parts of the world have, but we now have... Well, Dickridge thinks that we'd have one in 2016 if Hillary won. Well, I gather she might uh, be running on... A, you know, his view is no Republican can beat her. Right. I think she's extraordinary, and I do confess that before I was in this nonpartisan uh, position, I was a Hillary delegate in 2008 and, very, and was and am very proud of her. Um, uh, I don't know what she'll do in, in 2016. In political years, it's about 400 years from now, so lots of things can change. Uh, but at the Wilson Center, we now have a platform called the Global Women's Leadership Initiative. And under that, we have uh, two projects. One is called the uh, Women World Leaders uh, Project, which is an organization of women who head countries. Women currently head about 20, 20 countries. And oh, since 1960, which was when the first woman was democratically elected as head of Sri Lanka, uh, there have been about 50 women, most of whom belong to this organization. And then the other one is a, um, a public service initiative to train uh, women to hold 50% of the public service jobs in the world by 2050. And we're doing this through countries and their ministries that set this goal and through women's colleges uh, both in the U.S., the, the old seven sister colleges, which are well known, I attended one of them uh, back in the day called Smith College, uh, but also through women's colleges around the world. And these are uh, very interesting organizations. We're getting a lot of uh, visibility for the work that we're doing. And uh, as a woman, first um, head of this organization who happens to be a woman, it makes me very proud. You know, uh, I've heard you uh, this, uh, refer to yourself as a recovering politician more than once and now you've had the perspective of being away from the House of Representatives for a little while. What looks different now? When we, the types of challenges and problems we're talking about, when you think about solutions, what looks different now from when you were uh, part of the group? Well, <laughs> I, I don't think I have changed that much. Uh, I still wake up in the morning and race to turn on uh, National Public Radio. I'm a huge NPR junkie read the newspapers, come into the office, read the political newspapers. 
I always did that. And I, I think, I think you right? could have me, you know, I could have severe pneumonia in the hospital and I'd still be doing it. Yeah. Uh, no, I, that'll never change. So my appetites haven't changed. I'm in a place where I actually think I can work on uh, what I'm passionate about more effectively. The platforms at the Wilson Center are better, uh, certainly in, these, in this day, than the, than the floor of the, of the House of Representatives. Uh, we can convene and do convene through these uh, new national conversations that we hold. Uh, heads of state, uh, those people who are most capable of addressing issues. Example, we, we recently had a, a so-called NatCon on how to get the public into the discussion about national security. And we had Steve Inskeep, who is uh, one of my all-time faves, who, who moderates a morning edition on uh, National Public Radio, be the moderator. But participating were Keith Alexander, who's a four-star general who heads Cyber Command at the Pentagon and uh, the National Reconnaissance Office. And uh, Susan Collins, the Prince of Senator Susan Collins of Maine, Republican, the principal author of the cyber bill, which is stalled in the United States Congress, Anthony Romero, the president of the ACLU, which is usually a critic of, of any legislative uh, approach that might uh, require people to uh, surrender a little privacy. But here he was a big fan of the notion that individual people's um, emails can be compromised if we don't have some form of a national program here there and I was the fourth person and being able to have that conversation in, in uh, at Wilson is is first of all fascinating second of all it's unique because you can't have those conversations and, on the hill and it was a conversation not a debate very civil correct uh, very uh, very reasonable well well if I can allow and very myself, relevant and very relevant if I can allow myself a bit of personal indulgence. It's, it's uh, been exciting to be part of the Wilson Center under your uh, direction. It's, it's an exciting time, and I wish you continued good, sec, uh, good success in the coming year. Well, thank you, John. Happy holidays to our wonderful and hardworking staff. I mean, this is a team. Uh, it's one team, one goal. Uh, what I do with the Wilson Center, I can only do as part of a team. You're on the team. Thank you for your personal efforts. And to a dangerous world, may 2013 be far more peaceful oh, and that. far more happy and healthy for um, many of the billions on this planet. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll return in a moment with this week's context feature. When we do, we'll ask a question, is the new Cold War, is a new Cold War possible at this time? And it, it would be with China, not Russia, obviously. And we'll delve into that question right after this. The Wilson Center is America's living memorial to its 28th president, connecting the world of policymaking to practical options derived from the world's finest ideas, research, analysis, and honest nonpartisan conversation. Visit us on the web at wilsoncenter.org. And now we return to more dialogue at the Wilson Center. Welcome back. Cheng Li is director of research with the Brookings Institution's John L. Thornton China Center. He shares his thoughts on the likelihood of a new Cold War, this time between the United States and China. Let's take a look. Is it useful to use the Cold War metaphor when discussing the possibility of a negative turn for China-U.S. relations? Well, the, the idea of Cold War is a conception. It depends on how you look at that, with how much you believe that. Now, certainly that Cold War was real during uh, the 1960s, you know, 70s, and et cetera. But uh, now it's uh, very problematic because by definition, the Cold War is a confrontation of two blocks on ideological and military front. You can say that military front, maybe there's still some uh, tensions between countries like China and United States. But ideologically, I do not see that uh, China has ideolo ideology deliberately want to challenge the United States. But most importantly, during the Cold War, there's no global economy. Soviet bloc is not part of a global economy. So, but now we see a real globalized economy. China is a part of that. And uh, if the United States economy not doing well, China also suffer. And uh, if China, vice versa. So this is tells us we really in a new era, in a new world. Now, uh, Einstein once said that the, the release of atomic bomb has changed everything except the way of thinking. We can borrow that that the economic globalization has changed everything except way of thinking. If you still preoccupy the old idea of the Cold War or 19th century you know, worldview that the two major powers can only be conflictual, 
then you will buy that argument. But I personally think it is completely irrelevant in today's world. The danger is some of our policymakers, whether in China or United States, elsewhere, still hold that view. What are the areas or issues that have the most potential to create conflict in the relationship? Well, it's a, it's probably uh, a certain not on ideology. Uh, also, will not be on the uh, the trade issues, but it's the territory issues, which the Chinese think is very very crucial. It's the territory integrity or uh, or sovereignty issues, uh, uh, particularly in the area of uh, South China Sea and East China Sea. If there's a a a, a, a incident, uh, or really the uh, territory disputes out of control because of nationalism then we are really caught in a very dangerous situation. Because from Chinese perspective, that the uh, United States want to put China down. Now, the last couple of years for US foreign policy in East Asia or Asia Pacific was very, very successful because that uh, we have more allies and more countries hoping that the United States will return to Asia. But uh, that policy, the successful policy, has a huge cost because by doing so, you alienate the Chinese people, not only the Chinese leaders, because the whole nation and the majority of people, including some intellectuals or liberal intellectuals, feel that the United States wants to put China down. Now that has some costs involved. So that's a danger. During the presidential campaign, there was tough talk about China. Do the Chinese take U.S. political rhetoric seriously? Well, Romney claimed that the, the, the day one when he became president, he will, you know, uh, uh, identify China as a, a currency manipulator. So that's a gift that he will give to China in the day one as his presidency. Fortunately, that, that did not happen. But on the other hand, I think Chinese have difficult to understand. Now, China wanted to buy U.S. Treasury bonds, and the China contributes the the consumer, uh, you know, uh, uh, low price products in Walmart, Kmart, and etc. And uh, Ch uh, but still, United States blame everything to China. And, uh, but you look at the United States yourself, you have $16 trillion billion deficit. And why you just blame everything on China? Now talk about the manu uh, uh, currency manipulator from their perspective, that the United States is so powerful, you are really manipulating the currency and because for your interest. So they believe it's an unfair game. Now this could be completely wrong, but uh, whether it's wrong or right, this is their mindset at the moment. What will the transition to Xi Jinping mean for relations with the United States? Well, the important thing is that uh, the players of uh, international uh, relations, particularly U.S.-China relations, become multiple, not just the, the executive branch, not just the president or chairman of, of, in China, but uh, you have the interest groups, you have the public opinion, you have the, uh, in China you have a military, and. Uh, so in the United States, you have lobbyists, you have different uh, you know, groups. So that a complicated relationship. It's not like a, a particular in China that the leaders no, no, need to respond to China's uh, domestic forces. That some Chinese leaders constantly uh, told the United States leaders that we have politics too. I mean, we have the public opinion, we have the interest group. Now that complicated whole things. So sometimes leaders may be interested in uh, uh, have a constructive uh, relationship, cooperative relationship, but uh, the Chinese public may think that uh, this kind of uh, 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 soft approach to U.S. demand uh, sacrificing China's interests. The military think that uh, you should be much tougher to defend a certain uh, vital interests. And uh, so this is really complicated the whole situation. So in a way, we enter a new period. We need to be sensitive to about the complicities in the Chinese society and the uncertainties in the next few years uh, 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 during the nature of China's social, political, and economic transformation. The threat of nuclear conflict loomed large during the Cold War. What is the role of nuclear weapons in the China-U.S. equation? Well, I think to a certain extent, uh, uh, we need to answer that question because during the Cold War, China, yes, had some chaotic period during the Cultural Revolution, but at that time, that Mao still had absolute power. But now China also is in another conjunction in its uh, uh, transformation because there's a possibility that uh, leadership, because of lack of legitimacy, because of the state-society relation has changed, may enter a period with, with economic crisis, with political crisis, maybe even chaotic situation. Now, this is uh, only a scenario. It's a probably not the most likely scenario, but it is an uh, important uh, uh, possibility. 
Now, here raise a policy question for the United States, whether we, we want to see a successful China or a, a failed, chaotic China, which you can imagine all the kind of problems, including some of the radical group could control the nuclear weapon. So this is the question is whether we should really fear China's success or fear China's failure. My answer is we should fear China's failure because if Chinese society continue to you know, uh, uh, progress as has been the case, you see the rise of middle class, you see the rise of legal profession, you see the, the new generation of Chinese college students, they are more similar to their peers in uh, you know, other, other countries rather than their older generation. So all these things are very much in line with American value and American interests. So this is the direction we hope rather that China become chaotic, become violent, uh, 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 have a violent revolution. So that uh, policy decision we need to think about and think very hard. New editions of Context can be found each week at wilsoncenter.org slash context. That's all for this week's edition of Dialogue at the Wilson Center. On behalf of all of my colleagues, I want to take this opportunity to wish all of you a most happy and healthy holiday season. We'll return in the new year with new episodes of Dialogue. Until then, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Television and Radio. Our host's Twitter feed is twitter.com backslash John Molusky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhcnetworks.org. The dialogue continues on our Facebook page. Check out our latest video status update and join the conversation. To find us on Facebook, search Dialogue at the Wilson Center. Here's the update. Hello and welcome to Dialogue at the Wilson Center's Facebook page. I'm Sandy Fo from the Kissinger Institute. And I'm Michael Darden from the Brazil Institute here at the Wilson Center and this is today's video status update. With the economy beginning to show signs of recovery, many of us are wondering what the impact will be of falling off the fiscal cliff. Will it mean higher taxes in the middle class? How would it affect Social Security and Medicare? Leave a comment and let us know what you think. We look forward to hearing from you. And be part of the dialogue. Like our page today. For more information about the Wilson Center's Brazil or Kissinger Institutes, visit us at www.wilsoncenter.org. Thank you for watching and have a great day.